I'm doing is legal. This is why I believe I'll receive justice in the Howard Court. More to right, right center than the left. Oh, it is gone! He did it! He did it! It doesn't matter what your background is and where you come from. If you have dreams and you have goals, and that's all that really matters. But there's only one you say, Bolt. I owe you know a lot to Charlie. The freedom of expression that the entire world could see. Our world could see. When you black, it's not a movement. It's a lifestyle. This is who we are. me, my inspiration over the years has always been Michael Johnson. Growing up, I looked up to, oh, geez, Michael Johnson. My overall goal is to finish my career as, as one of the greatest athletes ever. I asked him, why did you retire? And you were dominating so much. And he said, oh, I've done everything I wanted to do. I've accomplished all my goals. Four Olympic gold medals, eight world championship golds, and world records in both the 200 and 400 meters that lasted well over a decade. Michael Johnson's career was something else. He was the track athlete who defined the 1990s. Instantly recognizable with his upright technique and relentless will to win, I don't like losing because I know that all of the races that I, the, the few races that I have lost, I know that I could have won. So you know, I go out there to do the best that I can. And when I've lost races, I feel like I didn't do the best that I could. And, and, I, and I don't like that, but I learn from it and move on. And I think that's what has made me uh, better. Not only was Johnson's technique unfamiliar, so was his specialization. The 200 meters is normally the domain of sprinters, not athletes who also tear up one full lap of the track. At Atlanta 96, he became the only man in history to complete the 200-400 double. You never know what to expect in, uh, in a, with an Olympics in your own country. So it was, um, it was a great experience for me and uh, I didn't know what to expect going in, but it was certainly uh, the highlight of my career and could possibly be the highlight of my entire life. A feature of Johnson's career was his consistency. He was unbeatable when he was fit, especially in the 400, where he won 58 consecutive races from 1991 to 97. To be that consistent and, and repeat, um, sprints um, every four years on the day, at the moment, you've got to deliver your best performance. Um, that's that's pretty that's pretty difficult. If you compare that to other sports, whether it be, you know, golf or tennis with Grand Slam events, you have those events every year. You have an opportunity every year to do it again. Um, this is every four years, um, and on the day, at the moment, you've got to deliver the performance. Despite his historic success. Johnson never allowed himself to be sucked into the hype, retaining an air of focused professionalism throughout his career. I know going out there every day when I go out to compete that I can be beat. I, I know that, and that's what keeps me training hard every day in practice, because I know that I can be beaten. And I think that from the outside looking in, because of the margin that I've won by and because I've won so many races and I rarely lose, that. Most people on the outside think that, you know, I can't be beaten until they see me beaten and start to talk about, oh, he's human and he's vulnerable, and that's always been the case. To illustrate his point, the one failure on Johnson's CV, the 200 at Barcelona 92, still hurts. He was struck down by food poisoning and could not live up to his world number one ranking. 
Even a gold medal in the 4x400 relay could not make up for the disappointment. That was not a very good day at Olympics for me. Johnson more than made up for that disappointment four years later in Atlanta. Atlanta 1996 was Michael Johnson's Olympic Games. In his home country, in supreme form, he was the man under the most pressure to deliver not only gold, but world records. The objective here is to win the race, and you know, world records come when they come. I'm just here to win, and whatever time I run, it's not important at this point. Nike even fashioned Johnson bespoke spikes for the occasion earning him the nickname, the man with the golden shoe. Doesn't matter, you know, I mean, as far as how fast I'm going to run, it's the weight of the shoes and the way the shoes are actually made, which, which helps me to, uh, to run faster. And Johnson lived up to top billing, setting a world record in the 200 that sent shockwaves through sport. His time of 19.32 smashed three-tenths of a second off of a record normally chiseled away in fractional increments. All I saw was a blur and a swoosh, remarked 200 meter bronze medalist Atto Bolden. Running well within himself, Johnson also set an Olympic record in the 400. In track and field, he was peerless pushing the boundaries of human capability further than anyone could conceive, further than anyone, until Usain Bolt arrived on the scene. Johnson remained above suspicion throughout his career, despite competing in an era rife with doping. In retirement, he has focused his energy on the importance of clean sport at both the individual and institutional levels. The issue, though, is when you move from, you know, the conversation being less about who may or may not be doping to whether or not the organization trusted with protecting those clean athletes and policing the sport, uh, whether or not they are complicit in covering up tests and, and protecting athletes and with corruption and bribery uh, allegations. That's a whole different ballgame. Johnson has backed up his words with action. In June 2008, he voluntarily returned the 400-meter relay gold medal he earned at Sydney 2000 after Antonio Pettigrew, who ran the second leg, admitted he took performance-enhancing drugs. In my opinion, nothing should be left, you know, as sacred, you know. Uh, I think that anything should be um, subject to review and change or adjustments or complete, uh, you know, revamp of any of the systems involved with the sport. Not only the t testing, uh, or, um, you know, but also the administration of the sport and the way the organization is run. Johnson has also become a respected coach and prominent television analyst, giving him a front row seat to the Usain Bolt show and the Jamaican shattering of his 200 meter records. Johnson has never been afraid to speak out, so it's no surprise to hear his powerful voice among the chorus of discontent around the treatment of African Americans in the United States. As a record-breaking African American, he is well-placed to undermine the rhetoric of white supremacism. When the Black Lives Matter movement sprung up in response to police mistreatment of African Americans, it was quickly adopted by leading athletes. Johnson recognizes the power of sport to bring people together and drive change. We know that sport has incredible power and people, you know, respect and follow athletes. And so every athlete has a, an opportunity with 
this situation to help to, to continue to try to sustain this momentum. Such has been the dominance of Usain Bolt in the 21st century. You'd be forgiven for thinking track and field begins and ends with the Jamaican star. But Bolt would not be the athlete he became were it not for the man who provided the inspiration and set the targets the rest of the world thought unbeatable. A man who ran differently, spoke differently, and continues to think differently. The runner of his generation, Michael Johnson. Football has a long and troubled history of racism on the terraces. Bananas were hurled onto the pitch in England. Monkey noises remain a scourge in Europe. And authorities around the world repeatedly fail to confront the problem. So it's fallen to athletes to take the initiative. Footballers like Kevin Prince Botain. There were times in my life when I didn't want to deal with the subject. I tried to ignore racism, similar to a headache that you know it will go away if you just wait long enough. But that was misconception. Racism does not go away. If we don't confront it, it will spread. Boateng was born in Berlin to a German mother and Ghanaian father. He was a talented youth player at Hertha Berlin and soon earned a lucrative move to Tottenham Hotspur in the English Premier League. But he didn't find a stable home until landing at Italian giants AC Milan in 2010. And it was during his three years as Sincero that he established his anti-racism credentials. In 2013, when Milan visited Minos Propatria for a practice match, Boateng and several teammates were the targets of racist taunting from the stands. Boateng reacted by kicking the ball into the crowd before leaving the pitch. It was a rare statement from a footballer of color that enough was enough. The big problem with racism is that there's no vaccine for it. There are no antibiotics that you can simply take. It's like an extremely dangerous and contagious virus. It is emboldened by our indifference and inaction. Boateng was inundated with support from the football community. The following month, he was appointed as the first global ambassador for the FIFA Anti-Discrimination Task Force to work alongside FIFA Vice President Jeffrey Webb. I definitely commend uh, Kevin Boateng and, and not only him for his encouragement and leadership, but also to, to, to the players, for his teammates, for standing with him and supporting him. In football in total, uh, none of us have, I don't think any of us have, have gotten it right, perhaps in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, to be honest with you. So I think we need to look at it from, from a complete uh, new perspective. Boateng's influence didn't stop there. By March, he had become a United Nations ambassador for anti-racism delivering speeches in Geneva. We have to do something and we have to fight against it. But it's very important to not fight against it with anger because then we do something bad as this, these people are. We have to fight against it with smiling, with humor and with positivity. Boateng was now the figurehead of football's global push to eradicate the sport of racist behavior using his status to encourage other footballers to take a stand and support teammates on the receiving end of abuse, like Yaya Torre later that year. As I said always before, I think um, 
we all we all have to help and we all especially us because you from the media or us who are always in like in television or we're famous people we have to we have to help that and we have to push against that because it's impossible that in 2013 things like this still happens and I'm very sad for Yaria that he has to that he had to experience something like that Despite all the attention paid to Boateng a decade ago, racism remains a major issue in football. I think the message is we are fighting against racism and we do it in an efficient way. Rhetoric from leaders rings hollow while they fail to act against clubs and competitions that do not impose adequate disincentives for misbehavior. Nothing has changed, it's the same. The only thing was changed that racism is more like uh, hidden, you know, it's not uh, up front anymore or people chanting or whatever because they know there's going to be sanctions or people are going to watch. So it's just a little bit more hidden, but it's still there because uh, if you see the last five years, there are a lot of things happened still. And um, it's very, very alarming because after five years, nothing happened, nothing changed. That's sad. After setting a standard in football, Boateng has seen activism flourish in the United States with the likes of Colin Kaepernick and LeBron James demonstrating the impact athletes can have in amplifying a message. That's the moment we need, you know? That's the stamp we need to, to set out there, that people are fighting against it, that they let their voice be heard. It's easy to forget Boateng is first and foremost a footballer. Not only that, but part of one of the sport's most successful households. Brother Jerome is also a professional. And during a career with Manchester City, Bayern Munich, and the German national team, he's won a swag of major honors and been regarded as one of the finest defenders of his generation. I've said it one million times over these three years. If Jerome Boateng is fit both mentally and physically, then he is one of the three best centre-backs in the world. No player is better than Jerome. And Jerome has followed in his older brother's footsteps, decrying the treatment of black footballers. I think about racism, you never can do enough because you see how bad it is still at the world right now. So we can't say, oh, this country or this situation, we're doing enough. I don't think so. And um, because if we would do enough, then we would be not in the situation we are still and talking about it. So I'm really clear about that and think everybody have to, yeah, know that this is not the thing that will go in a month. The Boateng brothers also hold the distinction of being the only siblings to face off against each other in a World Cup. While Jerome continued on the path towards representing Germany, Kevin Prince switched allegiance to Ghana. And the two countries were drawn against each other at South Africa 2010. Jerome came out on top on the day and four years later was part of a multicultural German squad that took home the World Cup trophy. When you look at the, the personnel, you can see you know, how diverse this team was to be successful, and um, that's kind of what we stand for right now. But for some people, it's difficult to realize that we actually are. In 2013, Kevin Prince Boateng took a stand. He showed leadership in football's fight against racism and demonstrated that the biggest sport on the planet still has a lot of work to do. Steph Curry is the greatest shooter in basketball history. He's in the all-time top 10 for three-pointers made and for three-point percentage, with nobody ahead of him on both lists. But it's not just the threes. Curry is among the best ball handlers in the game. 
He can drive, he can pass, and he wins. He led the Golden State Warriors to five straight NBA Finals, winning three titles. He won consecutive MVP awards, the second seeing him become the first ever unanimous MVP. Now, all around the world, teams place a premium on shooting. Steph Curry has had a lasting impact on basketball. NBA commercials where it was like Steve Nash and Stephen Curry when they were younger and they were talking to their future self like that past me would have been like wait what like I'm gonna be on a video game cover Candace Parker might not have believed it when she was younger but in 2021 she became the first female cover star of an official NBA video game it was a landmark moment for women's sport and the ultimate accolade for a WNBA superstar. To be able to see yourself on a video game, I think it, it says how far we've come and how far women's sports has come. As a kid growing up, you dream of having your own shoe and you dream of being a video game. Like those are an athlete as a kid's dreams. And so to be able to experience that, I mean, I, I, don't, it, I don't take it lightly. Parker has been collecting accolades her whole life. At high school, she was the only player to be crowned the National Girls Basketball Player of the Year twice. At college, she won consecutive national championships for Tennessee, in the process, becoming the first female baller to dunk in an NCAA tournament. First pick in the 2008 WNBA draft, Parker has won championships with the Los Angeles Sparks and Chicago Sky, picking up a brace of WNBA MVP awards along the way. Throw in Olympic gold medals in Beijing and London, and you have one of the great sporting careers. For so long, women's basketball and women's sports was pigeonholed into this corner. And it's just because that's the way things have always been. And, you know, people have changed that. Um, and they've changed it for our generation. And so I think for me to be able to, to represent and do that, I, think, I hope it opens up more doors for, for others in the future. Incredibly, Parker's professional career has taken place almost entirely after becoming a mother. I think it's so important for me to, to understand that I'm definitely a mom first. Daughter Layla has been by Parker's side since 2009, and the pair are now investors in Angel City FC in the National Women's Soccer League, alongside Serena Williams and her daughter, Alexis. After bursting onto the scene as a teenage phenomenon, Parker has ground out a long career, linking the trailblazers of the first WNBA draft before her with the millennials who follow in her footsteps. At the 2008 Olympics, she was the youngest member of Team USA, 14 years the junior of Lisa Leslie. She is now the veteran, the next wave of WNBA aspirants look up to. I think it says a lot of the people that have come before me because I know that, you know, we're opening up more doors and we always talk about the opportunities that we're opening up from the next generation, but the generation before me opened up all of these doors. Um, for me to be able to first go out and do what I love and second, be able to, you know, go beyond that. Candace Parker sure has gone beyond, dunking her way to the cover of a video game and basketball immortality. 